video. We're back with the next episode of our Strith Fantasy Text RPG. Uh, last time we've been doing the giant quest. Uh, it's the last adventure that is showing up in Hawkler right now. Maybe after we do that, more will be there. But um, yeah, we're in the third portion of that. Apparently, every one of these ends in a bad note. I'm in my castle right now. Uh, so we're going to travel back to Hawkler. Yes, we saw Cookie or whatever his name is. <laughs> the cat we adopted. It's at the castle. Um. Yeah, so anyway, we've done. <coughs> oh, Giants Part 1, Giants Part 2. Now we're facing the actual giant himself. I need that. My treasure truck's up about some. A blender. Oh, it's a new ninja. Ninja comeback kitchen system. I could use a new one. But me no one time for this. I'm lazy bum when it comes to this kind of stuff. Anyway. Let's go, huh? Thanks so much for hanging out and joining me. I appreciate you. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I just killed my boy. Yeah, recap. <laughs> At the end of the second part, you emerge the tomb of Targanar, having succeeded in retrieving song, Stone Song, the one weapon the legend says is the power to feed the most fearsome giants. <coughs> yeah, so they killed Eivor. Apparently. Eivor staggers and pitches forward, landing face first in the tall grass of the edge of the makeshift camp. A long, thin dot protruding from the side of his neck. You spin around. Your every nerve steel for battle, only to find yourself confronted by four snarling cave goblins in black leather armor. One of the foul creatures clutches a wooden blowgun in its gnarled fingers, which you can only surmise expel the dart that brought down Eivor. The largest of the goblins step boldly towards you, flanked on either side of, by the two of its kin, each wielding a broad-bladed axe. The pet leader of the, this savage crew draws a serrated blade and lives at you, and menacing, at you menacingly as he continues steady approach. Like, just killed him, but me? Where's the horn? Rumbles the lead goblin, his festering face twisted in a hideous thing. Fetch it up now, or the poison that cut down that miserable rat will course to your veins. The goblin holding the blowgun draws the instrument to his mouth and prepares to loose a dart in your direction. There's enough venom on the tip of the dart to drop an ogre, hisses the leader menacingly. His honesty the indomitable just Jakan. Oh, he's royalty, is he? As a granted that your life should be spared if you end over that which belongs to him. Come now, let us not go against his wishes. Sinking feeling rises from within you as you realize that your mission to recover Stone Song was known, and that here at its conclusion has been compromised. You sense the full goblins are very much in hands, perhaps equally as fearful of the bold hero standing before you, before them as they are of the distant giant master. Are they equally fearful of me? Of course they are. Attack. I'm gonna go with um religion, especially with the goblin who, who has a blowgun training if you have any hope to survive. Uh, let's go with destruction. Because it requires the most power. The goblin treats it and fears the blowgun crumbles to dust in its clawed hands. The wretched creature fumbles to draw an axe strapped to his back as you need to attack. Quick combat. Yeah, panic. That's right. Who else wants some? Dead. Hey, Mr. Leader. I'll have the horn of your blood maggot. Grabs the last of the goblins as he levels the blade of his short sword at your chest. <coughs> <coughs> Goblin carnage lays, lies strewn about the ground at your feet. Please search that the, the remains reveals a small quantity of gold. Their weapons are typical crude goblin fare, save for the leader's sword who bears the mark of a fine craftsmanship. Quickly move over and examine the body of Evil. Evil is dead. Kneel next to his body and muttered a few prayers, vowing to no matter how all this turns out, the sacrifice he made will not never be forgotten. A small parchment glows through from the belt contains some gold tokens, and both of his weapons appear to be of good quality. I'm not going to take your weapons. I, mine are awesome already. The only other item of interest you discover most is belongs to a scrap of parchment from which is scrawled a brief note instructing Eva to find you in and about Hawklaw. You read the note. 
a couple of times and then tear it up, scattering the pieces into the brisk wind that carries across the wall. Why does he have a note? No clear indications of what your next course of action should be. You re replay it was last ones in your mind. We waited in the village of Elmbridge by an old friend of mine in a staunch ally in the battle against the tyranny of Jaskier Khan. You know how best to employ the newfound addition to our arsenal. Let us strike out west for Elmbridge at once. Taking into consideration this unsettling turn of events, you cannot fulfill the prospect of success and endeavor before you are now as elusive as ever, even though the legendary horn in your possession. With the final words of Iva still echoing in your head, and with only a vague notion about the location of the village, you decide to head west in the general direction of Elmbridge and seek out the nameless ally to whom Iva alluded. For three days, the lush countryside of Western Tisa serves as a backdrop for your journey to the village of Elmbridge, tangled woodlands, broad expanses of farmland and rolling green hills are all, all passed by on foot as you trek steadily westward, hoping to find Elmbridge before it's too late. It is early afternoon on the third day of your travels and you just finish skirting the southern end of the forest, White Forest Lake, when you spot a thin column of smoke rising above the tree to the west. Alright, let's go see. <laughs> You move cautiously to the trees to the west, and your eyes and ears alert for any sound of movement in the forest around you. A few minutes later, you're standing in the edge of a small clearing in the center of which sits a bearded man in a fur cloak, huddled near the small fire that is back turned to you. Suddenly, man turns to face you, and wants to summer. Since your presence, he smells warm and asks you to sit and share the fire. Yes, divination! There's a great deal of mystery surrounding this man, although you do not feel he's evil. You <coughs> difficulty setting his intentions with clarity. Alright, join him. I've travelled far to find you, Ellison, he says, and you warm yourself near to the fire. Travel is not something I am accustomed to, yet rarely do I find myself in these parts, I must confess. He asks the man how he knows your name and what his business is, and he ignores the inquiry and continues to speak as if he not heard a word. I bring something that might prove to be of use, he said, producing a thick bundle of cloth and handing it to you. It's a delivery that I'm glad I have the opportunity to make. Our meeting is no accidental encounter, yet do not dwell on its significance, for your energy is best spent on the task at hand. You wrap the bundle of cloth in a surprise when you, your eyes fall upon a magnificent sword blade buried in the walls of the fabric. The blade has been separated from, from one of a hilt upon which it once rested, but it remains nonetheless a remarkable piece. What am I supposed to do with this? Upon the shimmering blade in your hands is engraved an intricately detailed scene depicting a fierce battle <coughs> between a group of armored men and several giants. When it's reunited with its hilt, a sword of legend shall be reborn, said the builded man, his eyes reflecting the silver glimmer of the blade. Take the blade, and on the road that lies ahead, you may find what you seek. You glance up from the blade to ask the mysterious stranger that he knows of your business, and you are shocked to discover he is nowhere to be seen. The sound to your right turns your head in the direction you spot a vaguely human shape, obscured in shadow, receding into the gloom of the woods. As you are shocked to discover that there is now no trace of the small fire next to which you might have received it, as if it had never existed at all. Without further delay, you set off to the west, resuming your original course through the wood. The forest begins to thin out as you proceed, and you soon come across a well-worn road winding its way through the trees, running more or less east and west. You follow the well-worn road as it cuts its way almost due west to the outskirts of the forest. Nearly a mile along the road, you come across upon something that raises your spirits, a moss-covered sign attached to a thick wooden post indicates the village of Elmbridge lies only a few miles ahead. Along this very road, you're lazy to have located the village, and your redouble your efforts moving swiftly along the road comes to reach your destination within the hour. However, less than a mile past the sign, you encounter the first signs that all is not right in Elmbridge. You turn a bin and come upon the smashed remains of a wagon strewn across the road. Flies buzz as the bloody carcasses of two horses that lie amidst the wreckage. Sadly, when the horse is still breathing faintly, without hesitation, must must mercifully put the suffering beast out of its misery. The bodies of the two horses are riddled with deep gashes, and the search of the rest of the wagon proves a half half of an axe and a flint dagger. The animals are crude, bare at best, and blood work re employed by goblins. The realization is that goblins attacked this wagon and presumably killed and captured its occupants, causing a single feeling to well up in the pit of your stomach or indication that the means of Jashuga have already arrived at Elmbridge. If of what fate might have befallen the road village, you hurriedly follow the road west cautiously, scouting the edge of the forest. <coughs> Less than a dozen yards past the shattered remains of the wagon, something suddenly strikes your leg, and you look down to discover a small rock lying on the ground at your feet. <coughs> Peering into the woods, you spot a man lying just inside the edge of the forest, his body partially concealed by a blanket of foliage. He rapidly beckons for your 
for you for you to approach and without delay you slip into the woods and make your way over to him. Okay. The man introduces himself as Quag. Quig. I don't know. Quick. Quick tells you that Umbridge has fallen to force of goblins and ogres. You learn that the village received warning from a nearby settlement of Ox Oxrim that had an attack was imminent, and most of Umbridge's inhabitants fled to safety, save for a random militia who attempted to ill conceived defence. It was foolhardy at best, he says when singing pairs as he speaks. We could not have been prepared for a sheer number of goblins that stormed the village and swarmed us, or the band of ogres that followed them. I believe few men might have escaped with their lives, myself included, but there were over twenty of us pitching the fight. It was a deadly blunder. In a weak voice, Quig tells you that the goblin raiders were seeking someone who was apparently hiding in the village. You cannot think that someone could be the person whom Eva alluded to his final words. Whoever it is, it must it must have fled into the tunnels beneath the village for the last party of the goblins has entered the forbidden place. The last Quig by the tunnels he mentioned tells you that a sprawling underground complex of passages that already existed beneath the village. The tunnels are the remnants of the distant past. He says no one is certain of their origin or purpose, and it is forbidden for anyone to enter them. Many believe the strange magic exists within the tunnels, and perhaps hiding some secret, ancient secret. Regardless, there is only one I have ever known who has willingly braved those passengers. What is it? Quick tells you that Umbridge is no longer safe to enter. The goblins have taken up residence in the hostile village and now control all rooms leading into it. No doubt the band of ogres that smashed his way through us is in there as well. He said once he. As he struggles to get the words out, you tell Quig of your intention of entering the village and finding the mysterious stranger who reportedly fled into the tunnels. He casts a disproving glance at you, but is suddenly distracted by what appears to be a wave of intense pain. For several moments, Quig is unable to speak. He closes his eyes on himself, has the hell sharp, exhales sharply as he contends with the severe pains that seem to both take him. He wants you to come close and hoist up his bloody tunic, revealing a wide and deep gash beneath the breath of his chest. I may have seen my last sunrise this morning. No matter though. But I would see that you spared yourself death to which this road will lead you. Restoration. <laughs> Place your hands over Quig's wounds and instantly feel the warmth of your healing power flow into his body. Quig gasps and shrugs as a wide gash narrows and shortens before his very eyes until there's little more than a deep scratch across his torso. While he's still in quite a bit of pain, your healing powers have likely saved his life. He grins broadly and expresses his gratitude and surprise. I wish I could repay this kindness, he says, hardly able to contain his gratitude. I can tell you, however, that if you seek to enter tunnels, you should know that the entrance to the lies in the cellar of the church. I cannot recommend such a course, but I see there is more to you than meets the eye, friend. You thank him for the information, but oh, he only shakes his head and smiles. It may prove a fool's errand, but you go with my blessing, he says. Quig is still too weak to move, and you help him get more comfortable before you set off along the road, <coughs> along the edge of the road toward the occupied village. And then you, I say. <coughs> Less than a mile past the spot where Quig lay, you come upon the outskirts of the umbrage, passing several small cottages and large barns that have been r ransacked. The bloody carcasses of the three horses lay strewn. Well, they gotta kill the horses. Bang! On the roadside, and close by, the headless bodies of three men in leather armor, who presumably were members of the militia that paid for the bravery with their lives. The cruelty of the government sickens you. You are now more determined than ever to see your mission through, in effect, the final end of the tyranny of Jess Jakan and his wicked minion. Just beyond the wine and set cottages, the roads bend to the south, and in the distance you can clearly make out the cluster of buildings that comprise the heart of the village. Suddenly your eyes fall upon a more sinister sight. Not far ahead on the left side of the road stand two cave goblins, apparently guarding the thoroughfare that runs to the center of Elm Bridge. You quickly take over, covering the trees and the side of the road, thankfully. That you have not yet been spotted. You have, you have a feeling that getting past these two centuries that alerting every goblin in the village to your presence could prove tricky. <clears throat> Archery. Whew. Let's go. You barely, barely sound a goblin slumps to the road. Your arrow piercing his chest. The first remaining goblin seem confused, but upon catching sight of the feathered shaft shooting from his cohort's chest, he resumes. Assumes the defensive stance is as white with fear as he scattered air for any signs of his foe. Before the government spotted you, calmly notch a second arrow and use the well-aimed shot intended to deliver him the same fate as fallen companion. Success! Your arrow slams into the goblin's chest, shattering bone and tearing through his fetid flesh. Gas loudly for air, but the arrow is pierced one of his lungs. He struggles is in vain. In a matter of moments, he collapses and does not move again. The goblin sentry is not in the way you. Pause for a moment to decide your next course of action. Suddenly, 
somewhat think heavy slams to your back and totally the cord is thrown over your head. The cord bites at your neck and you're desperate to fight for air. The upcoming pressure's on your right, on your back, tightens his grip of the rope. Is he so you strangling me? My honor in combat is first rate. We'll twist your neck and we'll practice rotation and shoulder you send the murderous goblin and sailing soaring through the air. The miserable creature strikes the ground hard, crying out in pain as his left forearm snaps cleanly up it. That's what you get. Upon impact, before the goblin can regain its feet, you are upon it. A couple of nasty blows you in its wretched life of savagery. Not wishing to linger here, you hurriedly but cautiously make your way along the edge of the road towards the heart of the village. As you draw near to the heart of Elmbridge, you can plainly see the village is overrun with the large force of the goblins. Fearing that it's too dangerous to continue your direct approach, you quickly take up a position in the thickly wooded slope just east of the village centre. Mm -hmm. From your vantage point to the thickly wooded slope you just east of the centre of Elmbridge, you are able to see you see nearly the entire village and to clear the amount of movements the location of the goblins that occupy it. The foul goblins move in and about the ma ma major structures in the heart of Elmbridge, however, the majority of the activities seem to be centered upon the plain wooden church on the northern edge of the village square. You have no doubt the goblins' efforts are focused on finding the same man you've come here seeking. Though you know little of this man, the ally to which ever alluded in his final words, you realize that you cannot allow him to fall into the clutch of the giant and his minions. You carefully observe the five locations in the center of the village. I see the focus on most other goblin activity. Okay, we got the Badger's Den Tavern, the Mill. The the goblins are infested at the mill like ants. Oops. The stables, the meeting house, the meet uh, the church. Um, I'm gonna go stables first because I don't want them hurting the animals. Let's go. You move stiffly along Elmbridge's main thoroughfare, narrowly avoiding goblin patrol as you seek ever close to the village center. It is only a matter of moments you arrive, unseen at your destination, the stables. No viable alternative that you stride up and boldly enter. <laughs> <laughs> and then you behold structure. The moment you step inside, you discover the stable swarm of goblins, a cruel savage human nose, but quickly to destroy you, to your escape as you unleash a brutal assault in your ranks. Quick combat! Death. Death. I'm raining down death. Elementalism. Powerful air elements until surge to the path of the hurling bomb drives the far wall to your right where your detonates with deafening roar obliterating the hapless goblins of Washington the three standing with the rage of this destructive theory. Rage on, we're murdering, we're raining down death. Sweat streams down your brows, you step at the bodies of fallen gold and prepare to engage the next savage, bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty creatures. Death. Alright, we did it. Let's do telekinesis now. The, the projected barrier of your mind of the goblin bomb seeming the holding device, of course. The flaming vial sails past you and smashes into war, deafening with deafening war, littering the hapless goblins. Unfortunately, enough to be standing within range. You'll be ready yourself to face what's coming next. Death. Wow, they weren't kidding. Swarming. One eyed. A one eyed. It wasn't me. It was a one eyed guy. Hmm. Last remaining goblins take flight, shrieking wildly as they flee for their lives. With no further goblins to continue until you set about a quick search of the staples. Mm, get the stuff. The back. We've slain the goblins. Me, okay, the mill next because they're in there like ants. Do the hardest thing first, and then it just gets easier as time goes on. You move softly along Elmer's main thoroughfare, narrowly avoiding goblin patrol as you sneak ever close to the village center. It's only a matter of moments you arrive unseen at your destination. The mill, with no viable alternative to hang stride up boldly. <laughs> The moment you set foot inside, you discover the mill is swarming. That's right. That's why I came here. Uh, fortification. The goblin bomb sails into your hastily erected magical bear, detonating upon impact and blittering the handful of goblins. Unfortunately, have to be standing within range. The magical barrier dissipates, and you prepare to face whatever might come your way next. Death. Death. 
to do something next. Just, just think of a video of this, of just goblin at the goblin falling. How many is it? Unarmed. Why are they in here unarmed? Hmm? Kate. Oh, he's got a Kate. He's fancy. Oh, that's it. They flee, flee for their lives. Search the mill. Keep the weapon. I'm kicking him. All right. Now let's just go in order. So we get to the church. Get the relative safety. Headed to the tavern. Yes, we boldly step on in. Hey, hey, fellas. Hey, lady goblins, fella goblins. Are there lady goblins? <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen any. Even in Harry Potter, I've never seen any lady goblins. They're probably so ugly, they look like men goblins. <laughs> Is that mean? Is that racist? Okay, that's it. I'm doing good. No. Alright, let's hit the meeting house. Hey guys. Hey you guys. It's me. We are losing weight for sure. All this fighting. Armored. Wow. They flee, flee for their lives. Oh, these look nice. A lot of exceptional stuff, but I'm good. We're down to the church. <laughs> church is swarming. All right, let's go back to elementalism. Okay, a piercing street startles you. You look up and just in time to see a scrawny goblin hurl a flaming earthenware vial in your direction. Your whole fight when you realize the object is a goblin bomb. A crude but deadly incendiary device designed to kill or maim an enemy. Powerful air and elemental surge into the path of the hurling bomb and drives it to the, into the far wall to your right where it detonates with deafening roar, obliterating the hapless goblins are fortunate enough to be standing within range of this destructive fury. Death. <laughs> hey, rejuvenation. That's nice. Thank you. Just the joy of having rejuvenation. You're like you try to fight, you try to fight her, but then all of a sudden she's perfectly healed, back to full power. It's amazing. That's serious magic. Okay, keep death. 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 No, you must not know me. I'm Allison. I can fight for an hour. I'll just. <laughs> There's no flea. I'm back here. Yeah, okay, we're good. You stand in the recessed corner of the Albridge Church, staring down the open hatch on the floor below. The hatch is a set of stone steps descending into the shadow. You call the words of Quig. You set the stairs below. The hatch will lead into the tunnels you mentioned in. It is into the tunnel that creatures you stranger fled with the goblins pursuit. When Umbridge and the nearly free of goblin occupies, you feel it's safe to enter the tunnels as you wish to. Yep, let's go. Take your first few cautious steps down into the gloom beneath the hatch and prepare to enter the, the tunnel. You're standing in the base of the stone steps that lead up to the church. Nothing stirs. Why are there always tunnels under the churches? Did we talk about that? Nothing stirs in the darkness that surrounds you, and the silence that pervades the whole is quite unsettling. The pulse echo along the narrow, twisting passages make up this ancient labyrinth. It does look labyrinthy. Uh, an inexplicable sensation of disorientation suddenly comes over, and you struggle to regain your bearings as you endlessly you wander around the dark passages. Failure. Sensation and disorient go stronger and stronger until last when you finally begin. So society you find yourself standing at the foot of the sunset that leads up into the church. This is annoying. Come make is gonna do that every time? And I'm going north. Is there something in there to fight? I don't think there is. I mean goblins should be down here. Sound of many leathery feet slapping the stone floor. 
Are the pastors sending a pulse rate to you? And the sounds of it, and the sounds of a party of goblins head your way. They agree. A large party of goblins passes by within inches of where you stand, pressed up against the dank wall of the passage. You can't let them in the rest of your as they move past without ever noticing the long human lurking in the shadow at arm's length. They go, you can no longer hear the sound of bare feet flapping the floor. Step away and continue on your way. I, I mean, I could have took them. But I wanted the thievery points. This is fun. Oh no. Oh, yay. Whew. I was like, I don't want to start over. If I have to start over, I'm going south this time. What's that mean? Is it a boy? You rev at a dead end in the past and find yourself witnessing him to a horrifying scene. Two armored goblins and ogres stand over the body of a woman. The woman's face is painted in a pattern that suggests an attempt at camouflage is still alive but appears to be severely wounded. The two goblins begin sifting the air wildly spinning around his face. You hit his sneer spreading across the disease ridden faces. The painted one has a friend, said one of the goblins in a mocking tone. One of the goblins is just shot commanding the ogre of wooden. A thick, hafted wooden spear stomps in your direction. Attack! <laughs> We dodge it, and we hit it. When the sinister and the ogre is putting too much for one of the goblins, the cowardly creature streaks past you before you can re react and dispense the wound of the passage. The non man goblin sneers and draws its scimitar. You firmly plant your feet as you prepare to square up against the bloodthirsty foe. Mm, death. So with the bloody remains of the slain goblin, the rush to the side of the wounded woman, her face is painted in an intricate pattern of green and brown leaves, suggesting that it has been a Purpose of camouflage. She kneels beside you, looks up, she smiles with you. An unexpected rescue, but one most welcome, she says. If you help her to her feet and have to take a moment to steady herself, she tells you there's not safe to linger here. She quickly introduces herself as Theron, says that there is no way out of the tunnel. There is a way out of the tunnels nearby. There is no time to explain, she says, her eyes nervously scanning the shadows of the passage. The way out of here is not far. When we're standing beneath the open sky, we will have the luxury of speaking more freely. Let us go quickly. Follow Theron as she leads you along the twisting passages at the, at the brisk pace. Now and again, she stops and leaves against the wall, listening painfully. Following these episodes, it's nearly a minute before she dips her tune on. At last, she arrives at a rubbish up passes at the far end of which you plainly see the faint hint of daylight. Following behind Theron, you've navigated only half of the length of the rubble strewn passage when the sound of from behind lets you to approaching danger. And looking back over your shoulder, you just made to see a group of six cave goblins scrambling over the bridge in the passage as the rapid comes in on you. And within a human shriek of the approaching goblins ringing your ears, you shout at Theron, tell her to flee to safety while you cover her escape. Then with grim determination, you firmly plant your feet and steal your nerve to place the in own slot. Those three goblins draw to within melee range and immediately attack using the breeze, which shows the passage the best advantage you bravely engage the murderous tri trio. Trio, 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 trio. trio. Next two cave goblins pile up the corpse with their kin and thrash wild at you with crude wooden spears. The goblins seem determined not to allow you to escape from the tunnels. The tunnel! The last of the cave goblins strides forward and boldly engages you in a broad bladed axe, cutting the air only inches from your head. Or oh, he's dead. The bloody rings of the six goblins lace the floor of the rubble choke passage. You stop uh, an intrigue. You spot an intri intriguing bone medallion around the neck of the last goblin you slew, and you reach down and snap it from the length of the filthy street for which it hung. You little is idling you here any longer than necessary. Quickly check up your equipment and move. Then proceed with all possible haste along the remainder of the passage toward the distant welcoming light of day. You emerge from the rubble strewn passes into the bright light of the late afternoon and find Theron seated on a broad flat stone, her eyes closed and her hands raised above her head. Slowly she opens her eyes and when she sees you standing before her, she smiles. No matter where she rises, Steph swords you both her hands extended as she begins again close her eyes and sink the you take home for her which has immediately feel the water sensation spread throughout your entire body. I no restoration myself, I don't need you. <coughs> We'd expected both you and Eva would arrive, she said with John hands, and the fact that you've come here alone can mean there's bitter news in part. You inform Theron of Evil's fate, and for a moment she is silent, but her countenance does not betray even the slightest set of emotion. Fate is a wily creature indeed, she says, for the man that Eva sought to meet in Elmridge, Paris, in the very labyrinth with which she, we have just escaped. Four of us fled into the place within the pits of the village was abandoned, yet I, really, by the good fortune of your time arrival, am the only one to leave that wretched hole alive. 
Your words do not bring comfort, she said. She continues, for the means of the giants to have found you without prior knowledge of your mission is against all odds. A traitor walks among us, be sure. They're in a silent for several moments and appears to be lost in thought. When she again speaks, she tells you that a friend and ally that Ifa had mentioned in his final words was a man named Gathrid, a revered and long standing member of the band that has long striven against the merciless tyranny of Jast Jagat. In the West, a band is known as Whisperfoot, said Theron, though I have no doubt the name means little in these parts. Our struggle has been with Jast Jagat and his wicked minions, and it has been utterly dishonest if I say that it had been long. If I did not say this were long and bitter, the giant is a brute of foe and as cunning and elusive as a hunted fox. When his wrath has been engaged, however, he strikes quickly and fiercely, and I can think of a few things that I would fear more. We learn that Whisperfoot arrived in Elmbridge two days before the giant's minions attacked and over in the village. They were twenty in number and kept a low profile looking in the woods on the edge of town, hoping against hope that Ivo would return from his mission and try it, bearing the one weapon they hoped could turn the tide against Jasper Khan. You anticipate the question she's about to ask you before she is chance of voice and as you draw out stone song from much of possession, her eyes widen and she nods grimly. A faint smile momentarily replaces her stone demeanor as she gazes upon the ancient horn. Long as the horn haunted my dreams, she said gently, rubbing her fingers over the bands of the silver that decorate stone song. It's almost unfathomable that after so many years the answer to countless lonely prayers is here within reach. That means to ending the reign of terror that threatened to outlive us all. It's beyond all we could have hoped for. Darren tells you that one of the agents of Whisperfoot, a man named Kelwyn, who traded yesterday on his right, causing us some gold hungry traitors to the calls of his fellow man. He quickly gained the giant's trust and confidence and soon learned that Jester Khan was close to discovering the location of Stone Song, the one thing he feared ab above all else. Jester Khan's greatest fear is that Stone Song should be discovered upon the hands of his enemies, he says. She says, His fear is well founded, for I can think of none such as his wicked underlings that would think twice about turning it upon him. Armed with the knowledge he procured from the giant and his minions, Kelwin returned in secret and presented his findings to Ivo, whose vast knowledge of the legendary enchanted horn knew few equals. With the information Kelwin provided, Ivo was able to determine the location of Targonar's tomb and thus the final resting place of the legendary horn. Kelwin's is the last man that is member to join our ranks, she says, and his arrival could not have been more time than his man of valor and courage, with a giant, a great strength of body and spirit. We are fortunate to have met up with him. He is most eager to meet you, Alison. Theron tells you that there is little time to spare and that the plan must be enacted at once if there is to be any chance of using the horde against Jessica and with success. The most dangerous part of this yet lies ahead, she cautions, but unless I'm greatly mistaken, you know, strange to peril, Alison. The giant has struck first, but I count to be swift and final. Let's go and we must find the others at once. Suddenly the ground shakes and a series of massive footfalls pound the earth. Theron draws a short sword and turns to the west to face the approaching danger. The look of alarm on your face rapidly gives way to resolute anxious. She beholds the source of the thundering steps. It's a hill giant. Climbing up with hillside to the west, making straight for you is a pair of towering hill giants. A fearsome brutes lumber up the steep grade and pause once they reach the summit, standing only a dozen yards from them. Well, it isn't just your guns that Theron and Cole gets lost in the nearest of the giants, but it will suffice for now. Giant laughs, the deep rumble voice echoes off the trees and they stride in your direction. Theron charges the closest of the club wielding behemoths, leaving you to face the other. She's brave. Leap off the massive corpse and rush to the aid of Theron, who's been knocked down by the savage blow of the giant's club. He helps Theron to her feet, and just as two hill giants stop to give you other four to the west, the massive humanoids strike the ground dead and they would. Heavy wooden clothes and they move swiftly in your direction. The seventeenth sound of several bowstrings suddenly rings out from nearby forests and the hail of arrows shriek through the air. The feathered shaft slam into the foremost giant. The fearsome brute staggers back and topples over dead. The voice tremendous bolt strikes the ground with a reverberating thud. Seven men, armed with axes and long swords, their faces painted in much the same pattern. There is emerged from another part of the forest and rush past you to engage the remaining giant. You watch in sun silence as they quickly surround and cut down their outmatch foe with a lethal efficiency. Seven more men who rush to the floor and making a total of fourteen that stand the, by the corpse of the hill giants. Their faces all paint the same camouflage and leaf pattern as Theron's. And when the latter has regained her feet, she introduces them as members of Whisperfoot. To man, <laughs> the members of the rugged band seem impressed to make you acquainted. It's apparent in your <coughs> reputation as adventurers has reached even the more remote hills of Western Tisa. In the same measure of pride, you learn that you've often considered trying to recruit. They've often considered to trying to recruit you into their ranks. One of the men stepped forward, bow, deeply introduced himself as Kelwin, and says in a deep, rumbling voice that he's honored to have met you. 
They're in relation. And then the news of Viva's death, and after several moments, the men hang their heads in silent tribute to the fallen brother in arms. However, when Theron next tells them that the mission ended in success, that he arrived in Elbridge bearing a stone, so on the mood changes, one of somber reflection to one joyous celebration. Well done, friend, said Kelwin, placing his broad, steady hand on your shoulder. There's much to be done, though, and little time. Jess Chican is en route to Elbridge as we speak. Kelwin suddenly lapsed into a fit of violent coughing that lasts nearly half a minute. He eventually covers the page of parliament. That, ra that this rattle will be the end of me yet, he says. Well, the easiest thing to shake. Learn that this morning Kelwin returned to vis a visit to Jessica's encampment several miles to the south of Umbridge, where he bullied from the giant that stone since been secured by his goblin expedition. The horn is soon being route. I was somewhat taken back when he told me to bring the horn to Elmbridge and wait there for its arrival. For such a strategy will place into our hands, and not having known the outcome of our mission till moments ago, is a bold gambit on my part, one that might have been disastrous. Disastrously, however, it is now apparent from the past, for everything seems to be falling into place. He dictated that he would be approaching from out of the hills to the south. Kelwin turns his thickly muscled frame and stares off in the direction of the village as a company known as Whisperfoot bears a set off from the last leg of their long, standing perilous mission with the legendary stone song of the bold adventure who possesses it now counted amongst their ranks. Kelwin tells you that Jastrick Gan will be approaching Elbridge to the south and decided that he, you, and Theron would head in the direction instead of away to await his arrival. I walk straight into an ambush, says Theron. Letting up. Let us hope that by the time the first glass of stone song reaches his ears, his days have ended, for he is not likely to arrive alone, and there will not but be other dangers to occupy us in his wake. If the horn should fail, says Kelwin, he quickly says, No, it's better not to speak of such things, simply mustn't fail. We cannot ignore the possibility of the horn failing, says Theron, somewhat crossly. I would not sound the horn until Jastagon is as close as he can get. Should it fail, we must retreat to the north of the village and regroup. Battle against this wicked beast will not die with the failure of the chosen ploy. They are in a gesture of equipment and wipes a line of sweat from a bow. If the horn works according to the legend, we'll find ourselves wishing we had every wretched giant in the felt Thorin is a lion when its blast goes off, she quips. You glance at Kelwin and find her glare fixed upon Theron. One of anger that seems to transfix him past, however, and he turns to you, I've spoken a bit rashly, he says in a deep, rumbling voice. Theron's right. This is but one tactic to bring down the tyrant, and while its success ends our struggle here today, its failure can't be left. So it's latitude, so spoken by the stars, it did better work. Theron laughs and changes his sword across from Calvin. The time for action arrives, she says, examining sharply. It's a long one, huh? Several members of Whisperfoot was who dispersed into the forest following the battle with the hill giants rumors. Leading the group of horses into the open, one of the men hands you the reins of the fine city and tells you that it was Evil's horse. It's certainly easier to outrun giants in the back of a horse than on the flat of one's feet. Should it come to that, said Theron, who sleeps since the saddle with the practice ease. I've, I've done both, Alice, and I can hardly recommend the latter. Kelwin climbs on the back of his horse, though not nearly as graceful as Theron, and they both turn to face you expectantly, but you've already tapped your steed and trying to slow in the direction. The plan is settled. Yeah, I mean, I'm a master horseman. Ship. <laughs> the plan is settled. Theron, Kelwin, and you will head to the south of Elmbridge and set up an ambush for Jastra Khan. The remainder of the company, 13 strong, will take up a position west of the village where they will be out of sight from the approaching giant. Their parting company of three, 13 bids the three of you farewell and wishes you luck. As you turn and make your way south, heading t for the outskirts of the village. Within an hour, you, Theron, and Kelwin are set up. On the edge of the hills south of Elmbridge, concealed in a thick copse of trees on the edge of the well worn road leading north into the village. No one says a word as the three of you intently send the hills to the south, seeking any sign they might indicate the arrival of the giant and his minions. Nearly an hour into the vigil, you, the ground suddenly quivers slightly several times, and then the simple bellowing roar rises. Into the air from the north, there and gas and Kelvin turns his head direction on the sound. The faint din of raging battle reaches your ears. We are betrayed, says Theron. The, the giant comes from the north. He's one of our brothers. Quickly, we. It's Kelvin. I know. I know she didn't trust him. Theron is a rubbly silence, Miss Simmons. You snap your head to left and know that she's on the ground by a beautiful horse, apparently unconscious. You turn to Kelvin, but a sudden jarring blow from behind sends you toppling from the saddle. You plummet from the back of your horse, striking the ground hard and momentarily blacking it. I don't need no stung song to beat no jacket up. She can't. 
When you vision returns only seconds later, you stagger to your feet, horrified to see kill one speeding by the top of his steed, heading towards the sound of the distant battery. Who amounts you suddenly heard that stone song has been snatched from your possession. Slung over the killer's back, he rapidly sees this as legendary horn of Tagana. There's no time to waste. You quickly check therein and note that she's still breathing. Her injuries do not appear to be life threatening, and so after quickly rolling her onto her back, you leave it to the saddle right near you see no trail in the wake of the apparent traitorous Kelwin. <laughs> Though you've taken a buzz and on, this, on a fast hole, she proved to be a new match for Kelvin's right hand kill. As soon as you find yourself as your right hand kill, Kelvin guesses are your son of the castle's corn from both these and merely urges his steed onward. Horsemanship! Yes. I wish to use it. With some clever and daring riding, you manage to overtake and pull alongside your fleeing target in the bolt. Move your leap from the saddle and grapple the start of Kelvin. Both of you top from the back of his horse and strike the ground, speeding by underfoot with a giant force. Both you and Kelvin. Quickly regain your feet, miraculously, neither of you suffered any injuries as a result of falling from the horse. Kelvin glares at you, and despite the fact that he in a string of the confrontation, his physical size and an obvious strength made him quite intimidating. I ain't intimidated. <laughs> I've no desire to tangle with you, Allison. He growls a deep, rumbling voice, every bit as menacing as his physical stature and threatened me. Theron was a traitor, and I feared you were in league with her. I will see this through. Stand in my path, and I'll see you, Dad. I beg you. Don't be a fool. What's divination say? I mean, I think I have to attack. You hear this on your path, telekinesis, focus the pouch hurling towards you, using the power to mind you, read the objects. Sending it flying off to the right where you stand, you quickly turn to face Calvin. Once just, you just managed to go to Calvin, again, again taking fight and speeding on top of swift sea, you just made mounts when you note that your own house is bolted, leaving you without any means to effectively continue the pursuit. With no other alternative at hand and no intention of abandoning hope, you can be set off on foot, heading straight north towards the din of distant battle with a dull reverberating thud of heavy footfalls. The sound of raging battle to the north reached your ears, and you move into the village, believing that Kelvin has gone toward the battle. You quickly make your way through the deserted street and press into the rolling hills and to its north as you pass on the back of the small rise. By the northern outskirts of Elmbridge, your eyes fall upon a dreadful scene laid in this rolling hills just before. <coughs> <coughs> the massive force of goblins and ogres are engaged in a fierce battle with a small number of humans of the rolling slopes just north of where you stand. And you recognize the members of Whisperfoot among the vastly outnumbered human combatants. How could she be the traitor if you're the one who said he's coming from the south? Your first instinct is to charge into the fray and rush to the aid of the duel, which starts to enjoy by the sound of the horn in the east. Of course, conjuring out echoing in the hills and thunder of countless hoofbeats fills the air. On a cavalry bearing, the stand of the king arrives in the eastern as the hills and draws into a ridge of formation. Several of the raiders, riders rise up long carved horns until their heads are scoured as they again sound their instruments of war. More and more, the armed horsemen continue to appear and draw into formation behind their initial line. The foremost horses of the company strain against the burdens and stamp their feet impatiently as the riders wait to all the charge. Deafening chorus of horns sound it, and at once the horse legion cleanly divides into two separate forces, each charging headlong into the raging melee spread across the hills before them. the battle has been joined. <laughs> The bellowing roars for the air, sending an involuntary shudder to lengthen your spine. You look at the north in the direction of the sound, called a chilly sight, straight on the top of a distant rise, flanked by a pair of hill giants, and proceeds, preceded by a legion of armed ogres as a massive mountain giant, the gargantuan humanoid, which she assigns serves to dwarf the hill giants by his side. <coughs> Pause at the top of the rise and appears to survey the scene of battle spread out for him. It's your first glimpse of Jasper Khan, and he is truly fearsome. <laughs> the black metal breastplate strapped to his chest, a massive spike cloak resting spike club resting over his shoulder. Jester Khan turns his head from side to side and he watches the conflict that raises amongst the hills to his south. A, th a shock of thick black hair crowns his head, descending into matted locks just below his right shoulders. From the center of his wide face extends a nose that has been so badly broken it's barely recognizable any longer. Suddenly, your attention is drawn to a man on horseback racing along the edge of the hills in the direction of the giant. It's Kelvin. It gets not odds yourself, and once in a bit, to try and intercept him. 
No one on the edge of the forest scratching the eastern flank and battlefield swiftly making your way toward the hill that which Jester Khan has positioned himself. Even in the distance, the towering mountain giant is a terrifying spectacle to behold. As you cross the hills, you note that the armored ogres has formed a defensive ring around the giant's perch. About two thirds of the way up the hill, the two hill giants massing in their own right remain at the massive size, seemingly dwarfed in comparison to his tremendous bulk. Your eyes once again fall upon the lone rider who is now urging his steed up the slope. As cold as the lion ogres, the young beast apart to land the pass, and he continues his ascent as he is near the summit. Kelvin slows his approach and seems to be making some sort of gesture in the direction of Jester Khan. So the giant's eyes open with fear. With a single flip motion, Kelvin draws stones onto his lips, but before he can sound the agent horn, he expectedly topples from the saddle, striking the ground hard upon impact. Stones that flies from his hand, laying directly at the feet of the intended target of his magic. Jester Khan reaches down and retrieves the horn, his gaze momentarily transmits the ancient weapons, and he returns to his full, daunting height. He grins wickedly and appears to say something to Kelvin. Or staggers to his feet, and the first time he noted the feathered shaft protruding from his left side. The goblin who loosed the shaft stands several yards to the right of Jester Khan, no doubt awaiting the order of his cruel master. What happens next is still rooted in your memory to this day. Jester Khan steps, takes a step toward the risen Kelvin, and clutches his club. Swift, brutal struggle with the massive weapon sinks Kelvin's brawls to the ground several yards. When he previously said he does not move again. The mighty giant casts a derisive glance in the direction of Kelvin's body, but quickly returns to the stage with the enchanted horn resting between the thumb and four fingers of his left hand. <coughs> his brow furls, and the towering giant grits his teeth as he seems to be attempting to crush Stone Song with all his might. After only a few moments, he howls furiously and turns his rage to the giant standing to his right. A single powerful stroke from his club drives the hapless humanity to the ground, killing him instantly. The goblin whose timely arrow unholds Kelvin is now shared his apparent fate. Despite unexpected turn of events, you know that you must now take back Stone Song if there has been a chance of defeating Jester Khan. And with the horn resting firm in the grip of the giant himself, you realize the endeavor proved to be no small task. Still, you take consol consolation in the fact that Jester Khan, despite his obvious might, seems unable to destroy the horn. The din of the nearby battle rises in pitch, and you turn to look upon the brutal scene where your eyes behold an inspiring, granting you a new sense of hope. The cavalry at last, and Richard the Goblins are now embattled the size of a force of ogres. With the sound of the raging battle pounding in your head, you quickly move off in the direction of the giant's hill. <clears throat> You've covered less than 50 yards when you suddenly come upon a band of cave goblins making their way toward the battle. The eight armored goblins don't appear to be disturbed by the fact that most of their kin and either fled or been slain. The goblins have not spotted you, but they're headed your way. Um, let's see, gating. Back portal opens silent next to you, and immediately step into the swirling vortex. Only seconds later, you emerge from the portal and find yourself on the sweep of yards beyond the banner goblins. As the portal closes, you turn quickly and quickly move in the direction of the giant's hill. You reach the base of the hill atop which Jasjir Khan is perched. If at distance the towering mountain giant seems fearsome, but relatively close range, he is nothing short of terrifying. You note with a good deal of dismay that he wears stones on top. <coughs> Tucked into the massive high belt that encircles his waist. Jester Khan grumbles as he serves the ongoing battle on the hills beneath his lofty vantage points, as if he is dissatisfied how events are unfolding. He issues a stone command, and the black armored ogres with the ring of that ring the crown of the hill begin a swift but orderly descent as they move to join the battle at their master's behest. That command, spoken in tongue you cannot comprehend, dispatches the two hill giants that flank him. The gruesome pair make their way down the hillside. Behind the ogre, their gaze is fixed upon the brutal melee. You, they've been ordered to join that that contingent raid. They've been ordered to join that contingent raid in the hills to the south. You fear for the cavalry and members of Whispers who may still be engaging the enemy. For the arrival of the armed and ogre legion, the two giants are not likely to bode well for their chances of success. <coughs> you turn your gaze from the scene of the battle to Jasjir Khan. The mountain giants now stand alone atop a steep rise. His massive form ominously silhouetted against the bright afternoon sky. With a personal guard dispatched into battle, mounting the hill to reach him, which would prove to be a somewhat simpler affair. Knowing full well that the victory of the Chinese Crimeans will require the retreat of the stone, so you hope to tell your next forge of action. I think. Illusion. You haven't done that one yet. Your well crafted illusion has produced the desired effect. The illusion. The line of illusionary cavalry circling the base of the hill have. 
secured Jazjikar's attention. The giant looks down upon the horse soldiers now besieging his hill, studying them with a wary eye. With his attention pres presently diverted, you swiftly begin your ascent, move steadily up the back side of the hill, and a small while later you reach the crown of the hill. You stand on the crown of the hill behind a group of tall hardwoods just to the right of Jazjikar. The fearsome mountain giant is only a dozen yards from you, yet appears oblivious to your presence as his cold gaze remains fixed on the field of battle below. On the far side of the hilltop, still lying where the giant's blow carried it, is the unmoving body of Kelwin. You rest you from the body to Jasjir Khan, where tucked into the giant's broad hide belt, you behold the very object that Kelwin took from you, stone song. At, as this close proximity, Jasjir Khan is a more terrifying figure than impossibly have imagined you find it hard to believe the towering mountain giant whose every feature seems to hint at its unearthly mind can possibly fear any living creature. Despite the sobering assessment of his obvious lethality, you realize that the excess of your mission and the survival of those now in battle with the giant's minions rest in the retrieval of the enchanted horns of Targanar. Owing its present location, all indications are that it will prove to be no easy task. Let's see. I think thievery. It's a bold gamble, but you're confident that you may prove to be your best chance of retrieving the horn. You skillfully scale a nearby maple, creeping out of the end of the hardwood's broad lower limbs. And then, after muttering a quick pair, you leap from the blind, soaring past um, his belted waist within the arm's length. What? Suddenly, Jasher can turn and says, Rescue me, his grim captain and his twisting. I'm very good at thievery. The blood can tell. The blood runs cold, and it takes all your will to keep from physically cowering from before he. So, we have another hero. He snarls his deep, echoing voice now far. came from the rumbling of thunder. No would be hero has ever lived to remember the day he stood before Jasher Khan. So, do come, you're in warm. Your heart skips a beat. You focus your telekinetic powers on rapidly descending cloud that manages to send it off course to the right by several feet, bending, impeded by your powerful mastery of telekinesis, a giant blood lands several yards wide, listing an arranged bellow from his mighty wield that jazz your gun, presses angry jaws back his mighty. Your fight is with me, Jask. It's killing. <laughs> The sudden sound of the voice visibly startles Jasjir Khan as he turns to behold the source of the voice. You follow suit, your eyes fall upon the shocking sight, the very sound of the opposite shaken the giant. Battered and bloody, Kelwin is slowly staggering to his feet. Still in disbelief, unable to come to him how Kelwin could have survived this savage blow struck him by Jasjir Khan. The grim faced warrior fully regains his feet and draws his axe, leveling it in the mountain dragon. No heroes lived to recall the dead they stood before me, since Kelwin his voice the sun is without the giant. He boldly steps toward, I'm no hero, and you already fear me, worm. You watch his stump disbelief as Kelwin throws himself headlong with Jasjir Khan, executing a series of beautiful strokes that force the towering giant to retreat several steps. Jasjir Khan recovers from what can only assume is a surprise at the bold attack and counters the assault with a flurry of crashing blows. Prejudice seeming to defy reality, Kelwin parries and deflects each of those savage strokes as if they are made by another human sized combatant. You're certain that Kelwin is not all that he appears. He look, the look of fear passes on the giant's face as Kelwin again surges forward, swinging wildly with his broad pit axe. You sense the giant's growing desperation as he struggles to fend off the furious attack. A painful howl escapes from the mountain giant's lips as Kelwin's axe bites steeply into the exposed flesh of his legs, staggering in the mighty jagged giant and swiftly sending him to one knee. Despite the shock of the stunning tenevation, he remained focused on the horn tucked in the giant's belt. With Jess Jakan momentarily st stooped on his knee, stones on within reach, you rush forward and take hold of the mighty weapon. I've reclaimed the horn of Tangara. Gunna. <laughs> Jessica rose fiercely and draws back his massive fist before bringing it down upon Cal. When you're against him, Cal reaches out with both hands to catch the giant's fist on the down stroke. He thrusts his arms upward, repelling the blow, and sending the mountain giant toppling backwards in what can only be described as an unearthly display of might. The fearsome mountain giant regains his feet and. <laughs> and rises to his full height, roaring with rage as he prepares to strike Kelwin. The horn! The horn, you fool! The horn! <laughs> okay. 
You draw stone. You draw as you draw stone onto your lips. Jasper Gun turns towards you. His face ash and his eyes widen in fear. As a terror struck giant draws back his massive club and prepares to bring the weighty weapon down upon you. Last desperate attempt to preempting the sounding of the aging horn. For the mountain giant has no no mortal equal. He never tasted defeat. It is a fleeting moment of sheer terror, and it's already too late. The deafening blast erupts from the end of the horn as you force the air from your lungs into the enchanted weapon. The reverberating sound echoes through the hills. The countless repeated call, repeating call not heard since Tanganar himself last sounded the horn centuries ago. The hills again ring the voice of Tanganar's, Tanganar's beloved stone song. Jester Khan begins to tremble and you're forced to dodge his massive club as a mighty weapon topples from his shaking hand, striking the ground where you were standing only moments before. The fist and giant skin rapidly assumes a grey, deep greyish hue and he, and he flashes a look of burning hatred at you as he staggered to the left and right as he was struggling to maintain his balance. Suddenly, he turns his head skyward and cries out in anguish as the sound of the splintering stone replaces the fading ring of the horn. From the tubes of his boots, the tip of his head, the mountain giant is swiftly turning into a solid stone. With his ashen, hardening face contorted into painful grimace, the goblin slowly turns towards you. The giant, you won, then. He croaks, weakly in his voice, lacking even the slightest trace of his former powerful residence. Take pride in that. The petrification rapidly consumes the torso and spreads into space, above freezing the giant's anguish of countenance and the horrified look that transfixed it with the last fleeting terrifying moments of his life. Less than a minute after the sounding of the horn, Jashik Khan has been transformed into solid stone. He does not speak or move again. A stone sound of cracking chop stone of cracking stone draws your gaze to your hands where you behold an unexpected sight. Stone sound the horn of Tangara has itself become petrified. A stiffened sensation on the tips of your fingers caught you immediately and wisely drop the horn and strikes the ground and shatters into several jagged stone fragments. You turn your gaze from the pitch right form of Jas Jakan and the rings of stone stone through knowledge Kelvin. You are eager to take the brave warrior from the bottom row you played in the giant's feet. You are stunned by what greets your eyes. Kelvin says at the edge of the hill now, like the giant mountain giant, he fought for a frozen in stone. So he was a giant like the the brothers probably who got somebody to turn him into look like human. Look at Sorini, he speaks on the warrior's petrified face and he stands with his hands on the top of the end of his axe as his unmoving eyes gaze out across the hills to the west as if fixed on the sun on dis some distant but indeterminable point. Move over exam examine the petrified remains of Calwin more closely and unable to fathom why it is he who has shared in Jashikal's gruesome fate. You suddenly realize the dinner battle no longer rises into the air, your eyes fall upon the hills to the south only to find that the last people remnants of the giant's wicked army have taken flight, scatter scattering widely into the forest. With the leader defeated and their morale broken, the cruel minions of Jastra Khan no longer have a will to stand against the Tissian cavalry. One voice calls out from left, and you turn to bold a familiar face appearing over the crown of the hill. Who is it? Theron smiles upon Senior and makes her way over to at once meeting you in a show and crawl from beneath the shadow. Petrat form of Jastra Khan. The day long prayed for, she says, smiling broadly. She circles a towering statuesque figure of the mountain giant, gazing up at his frozen form and commending him in victory. When you tell her about the part that Kelly played in the giant's defeat, she now stoically and makes her way over to the petrified war. There and nears before Kelly closes her eyes in silent praise after nearly a minute her eyes opening, she rises and turns to face you. I pray for Kelvin, she says. May his soul find rest. There and pauses and turns to look back at the statue of Kelvin. I pray for Kelvin. But maybe we can count ourselves fortunate not to have had measure to deal with his wrath in another time and place without Jess Khan's to God his attention. But I say too much. It is not right that I speak ill of him in the light. It's fascinating. Let me say no more. Yeah, tell me what what's going on there. Standing between the petrified figures of Kelwin and Jess Khan, you and Theron watch the scene unfolding in the hills to the south. In the late stage of the fight, a band of border rangers arrive and help turn the tide against the enemy. The rangers now assist the removal of human dead from the battlefield and a small number of them pursue the fleeing goblins into the forest. Later learn that several members of Whisperfoot had fallen today in battle against the minions of the giant, but Theron tells you that with the defeat of Jash Jakan, their lives are not forfeit in vain. Each of us swore that we would see the end of his menace, she says, placing a hand on your shoulder. There are none among us that will not have willingly given his or her life to effect that end. Thanks to you, Alison. A long struggle ends here, today in triumph, alas. Alone, uh, at
at long last a victory. You and Theron are joined in the summit of the Captain of the Tissian Calvary, the surviving member of the Whisperfoot and three border rangers. All present stand silently before the statue of Jastia Khan, staring in awe at the petrified remains of the fearsome giant. Not to be believed, mutters the captain, slowly shaking his head. Three border rangers nod in agreement. Wow. <laughs> For nearly a month following the defeat of Jastia Khan, the towns of the villages of Western Tisa unite in jovial celebration of their freedom from the giant's long and cruel reign of tyranny. The death of Jastia Khan and the scattering of what remains of his foul minions signals the dawn of a new era for those who live beneath his oppressive shadow. The gratitude of those who realize you have forever changed and manifest itself in a variety of ways. At first, you valiantly refuse to accept any sort of reward for your part in bringing about the giant's demise. However, the envoys of people west of Western Tisa are relentless. When all is said and done, you find yourself quite a few gold tokens richer for your effort. A celebration is held in the village of Hockler, where for three days you and the members of Westerfoot are the guests of honor. At long, at length, the celebration comes to an end and life returns to normal throughout the western portion of the kingdom. It is then that you'll face the same farewells to the members of Westerfoot as they depart for their homes along the western border. And you may re make ready to strike out in search of further adventure. May one day I pass will maybe one day I pass will cross again, smokes Theron. Though I think I'm done with chasing giants for a while. A good long while. Here, you'll probably make more use of this than I will now. She reaches up and slips a thick golden chain over her head. She then presses the chain and the amethyst lifts the medallion that hangs from it is in the palm of your hand. Medallion of blessed fortune. Hey. It always brought me luck, Alison, and I hope it does as well for you. I thank Theron for the medallion and bid her with the other members of his foot a fond farewell. When they have departed, you two set out on your way, slipping out of Hogglaw as quietly as you can, your body well resting and your spirit thirsting for adventure. The name Ellison will never be forgotten by the people of Western Teaser, whose lives and his children's lives have been spared the dread and uncertainty of a woeful existence beneath the shadows of a ruthless shrine. The story of Ellison the Bold and Stone Song, an unfamiliar tale in this part, so one that's taken its proud and rightful place amongst the greatest historic episodes of the age. And to this day, on the crown of the hill now known as Giant's Rise, stands the statue of Kelwood and Jasha Khan, a clear day in their silhouettes, a red leaf visible against the backdrop of the pale blue sky, a constant reminder that of the fateful afternoon the long, late autumn long ago when the hills echoed with the voice of Stone Song one last time my bald hero stood defiant before the wrath of a giant. That's right. I win. <laughs> Woo wee! That went on. But hey, I got songs about me now. Isn't that exciting? More? Yep. We finished all the adventures by Hogwarts. How Fascinating. We got one more medallion of mighty misfortune. Oof. Glad I didn't put that one on, huh? What's that do? Takes gives me four might but takes off luck. And the medallion of blessed fortune gives me agility, might, spirit, and luck. What do I have on? I have the dragon claw amulet on. I have the medallion of winds on, but it doesn't take up a slot. So if I put the blessed fortune on instead of the dragon claw, what's my set look like? Um, it's not better. I keep my dragon claw. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you wanna so you wanna buy this stuff? with a lot of money. Alright, well, that's the end of the episode. I won't keep you too much past this hour. Thank you so much for hanging out and joining me. You know what I'm going to say. Peace. Peace, peace, peace.